Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the final parallel session uh, of the RIDE conference. Uh, we've got two sessions of 30 minutes. Uh, they'll be in Zoom, I think, for the first 40 minutes, and then we're going to be taking a, a wander over to wonder.me, uh, courtesy of the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange. Um, so we're starting off uh, today with uh, two Julies in the room, uh, myself, Julie Bose uh, from City University of London, uh, and also I'll be introducing Julie Phillips from uh, Thomas Jefferson University. Um, so Julie is uh, uh, Assistant Provost for Faculty Development um, and also Assistant Director of the Academic Commons. She's going to be talking to us about a faculty developer's perspective, uh, borrowing evidence-based practices from online learning to enhance teaching and learning. So I'll hand over to Julie now. Thank you very much, Julie. And as we are transitioning over, Julie has kind of start, alluded to the fact that I'm going to be talking about um, borrowing online best practices to inform faculty development. And I want to give just a slight bit of background as to where we're going and how uh, I got to this point. Um, in March of 2020, when the world went into lockdown and higher education went to emergency remote on learning, I was eight months in to a transition to a single learning management system. Uh, and so it was right about at the spring break in our universities and all of a sudden we had to turn the dial and move immediately online. But I am um, confident that the planning and research and strategizing that went into how we approached the transition to learning management system helped ease the transition to emergency remote online instruction for our faculty. And a large part of that came from the way that we utilized and incorporated um, online learning principles to inform and shape our approach to the transition to learning management systems. I am first going to start with just a, an overview of the university. We are a mid-sized university. We have a little more than 8,000 students and 1,400 faculty. We do have a heavy predisposition toward professional education, with a large majority of our population being in health sciences education. And so, um, we have, you know, a, a pretty specialized population, and when they approach uh, technology or education, it previously had been rather kind of fragmented and across the board, and so uh, we had this process in place and we're tracking changes, and we wanted to see what kind of technology adoption we had over the course of the pandemic. So after the spring semester in May of 2020, what we did was we looked at, uh, we surveyed faculty to see what they were using, how they were using it, and what kinds of resources or support that they needed. And so um, you will see from this chart that we had approximately 19% of our faculty who prior to the pandemic simply weren't using the learning management system. Now, for those of you who are experienced online educators, this might make you gasp, right? Um, and, and it might just seem antithetical to the whole process of education. But for a, a faculty that was largely rooted in kind of a traditional face-to-face -face environment, um, this was actually pretty good. But we did <laughs> have a significant kind of learning curve. And so in the middle of the pandemic, we did have about 5% of the, of the faculty population pick up and start using uh, the LMS kind of midstream, um, which we're certain helped kind of with the transition. You also see that there is a listing of a kind of key technologies that are uh, central to kind of online learning. And so whereas before the pandemic, we had less than 50% of our uh, faculty were using uh, video content or lecture content systems to create and record lectures that they could then distribute to kind of their learners. And we had a, nearly a 14% jump in that. And so we saw some radical shifts um, throughout the course of the pandemic in terms of technology adoption. And again, thinking about a faculty that was largely traditional kind of in the classroom face-to-face -face with learners. 
Um, but again, lots of planning went into kind of this transition. We had uh, started the, we had announced that we were going to move into kind of a, a new learning management system uh, in February of 19. And we announced the date for that transition would be June of June 30, or I'm sorry, we announced in, yeah. We were transitioning June 30th, 2020. And so we spent about six months planning um, for that transition and then um, eight months implementing kind of a, what was initially a year long transition into kind of a learning management system. And in looking at uh, how we were gonna transition, we really looked at what barriers there were to faculty adoption. We had initially delayed um, this was our second attempt to kind of transition. We delayed because faculty were so anxious about the change, given a lot of the change that had preceded um, the, the switch. And so um, in looking at the literature, factors that often get cited are simply the anxiety associated with any kind of new technology. And, and so uh, we knew that we had to confront or or plan or work around what faculty were anxious about. And that was simply, again, using technology. Also, finding time, which is, again, why we gave such a long lead time in that transition. And then access to effective faculty development and support for online learning. Underlying all of that was a need to have a clear vision about why this change was necessary and what it was going to do. And for me and for my team, which I should say is a multidisciplinary team that includes ed tech specialists, curriculum and instructional designers, um, data developers, kind of our web administrator, uh, we really focused on how we were going to enhance teaching and learning in all classrooms. It, it, didn't matter if you were someone who was on the forefront and already teaching online, or if you perhaps were one of the few that were involved in hybrid education, or even um, uh, those of uh, individuals who were not using the LMS at all. And so it was about improving teaching and learning across the university. And I did see the question, we did implement and we went to a single learning management system that is in operation now. And so we don't have any kind of data on what the usage looks like in the last year. We're meeting with our uh, LMS administrators next week to talk about kind of the usage patterns. And we've been looking at that. So. Uh, with kind of a knowledge of the barriers in mind, one of the things that we set about doing was thinking about how could we create a really robust, holistic faculty development initiative that would help folks make that transition. And so we started by uh, creating a scaffolded series of workshops um, that included kind of in-person, virtual, in-person as well as self-paced learning experience. We added individual consultations so that we were available experts were available to meet one-on-one. -on -one. We had kind of abbreviated kind of express sessions and just-in-time support where we thought about the ebb and flow of a given term and when faculty got busy or what happened in the beginning, middle, and end of a term and how we could strategically create workshops that would meet them where they were and what they needed in helping them with the, the new learning management system. And then we were able to provide 24 hours, seven support um, with our LMS provider, um, both in chat and by phone um, for those times when myself and my team weren't available. And so we had kind of, we were developing this kind of robust plan of attack for how we were going to manage the transition. And I have to say, we did not account for a pandemic. But what we had done was really look to the experts when it came to adopting and using technology. And, and so we borrowed heavily from the online learning principles that have demonstrable success and improved teaching and learning. And so um, on the screen right now, you'll see those kind of five key principles that informed and integrated, uh, you know, all throughout our process. And I'm gonna take you through each of those five just to explain a little bit about how those principles kind of seeped into kind of our um, holistic training plan. Uh, so the first thing that we did was really think about 
contextualizing the learning and, and making sure that it was very well organized and sequenced and that faculty had a clear path to how and what they would learn. And so in doing so, again, we, in, we had a core set of uh, a, a, a core set of workshops that we offered repeatedly. And so we offered approximately one workshop a week um, in the kind of months prior to the pandemic. And again, they were sequenced and we recommended the order in which faculty take those. They weren't required, but it was clearly developed to kind of gradually improve practice and develop skills. In conjunction with those workshops, we also had a number of asynchronous or self-paced or kind of print-based and video-based material that complemented those. So for those individuals who weren't able to join us, they had other materials that they could use that were linked to kind of those synced workshops. And again, in all of this, we had a number of templates that kind of laid out the organization. And, and kind of the practice. So again, talking about how you organize the learning and, and kind of creating a structure to help uh, guarantee success in some ways. Within that, we emphasize the ability to get practice and feedback. Uh, and, and so we had built in practice sessions and uh, feedback sessions in our live sessions and in our asynchronous sessions. And so in live sessions, it's easy enough, we can circulate around the room, we can look over the shoulders, people are typing into their computer and um, uh, kind of ask them to watch or what we're demonstrating on screen and then to do it themselves. And so we were actually walking them through tasks that they would be doing as a faculty member and having them practice that in real time with experts in the room. For those people who didn't join us, we did have kind of a course or several different courses and or even kind of guides um, that were kind of very chronological and how to go about, you know, doing specific functions in um, the learning management system. And with that, we made sure that we had knowledge checks. So if it was text-based, they were answering some questions. If it was skills-based, they were actually doing something and providing evidence for that. And we monitored that and provided them feedback. And I have to say, we did it on the learning management system. So we got people in the new learning management system right away, even if they didn't plan on using it for the next nine months. We made extensive use of exemplars and models. Again, that demo course um, that we use for all of our training that offered the full functionality. Uh, uh, we were so focused on what would faculty be doing in the classrooms and what did they do in terms of kind of their traditional teaching practice to help them achieve learning goals. And so we kind of catered to or really emphasized how the learning management system could supplement those same tasks that they were doing in the classroom. Uh, again, we had course templates, we had module templates, we had assignment templates for all, you know, we had quiz templates with examples for what they could do and how they could leverage kind of the learning management system. And this was all baked into the templates. And so if they had, in addition to kind of the workshops um, and presented as individual pieces. And then one of the important things we did with our early adopters, because we had people who jumped on this new learning management system immediately, um, much sooner than we had anticipated. And they were kind enough to start uh, taping testimonials for us and talking about how they used the learning management system and what it had done for them. And then we took full advantage of all of the, you know, all possible means for distributing and sharing content. And so in, in synchronous and in asynchronous modes. And so we made great use of, of multimedia and prepared videos that we did as well as the vendor did. We had those text-based resource guides um, and, and making sure that those were available in kind of across the board for all users. Those who came to us in person and those who were confident enough on their own and their technology skills um, to practice that. And then again, we had kind of the expert to peer. And so that was the team of the, uh, the curriculum and instructional design team who was very familiar um, with the learning management system and the tools and kind of online course pedagogies and how to kind of uh, really uh, kind of enhance um, classroom experiences with uh, technologies. And then also we made great use of peer-to-peer. -peer. And so especially as uh, the pandemic uh, 
kind of continued and, and we progressed throughout the, the year, having faculty members come in and talk about how the learning management system and how they used it to encourage and, and grow um, kind of their, uh, their teaching presence and their skills when it came to what turned from remote um, emergency instruction to online instruction. And we still have some pain points there. And then uh, one of the things that we did early on, and it, and it goes back to kind of one of the concerns about how and what individual will use, is that we really emphasize kind of a, a core set of tools. Um, anxiety is often created around how complex tools are and what all, you know, just being overwhelmed with all of the options. And so we really decided to focus on a very specific set of tools. And again, this was in the months leading up to the, the pandemic. Um, and then with the pandemic, we did make some shifts. Um, but we had um, been planning again, thinking about where we wanted to go as a university and what the overall landscape was and kind of trying to push people, not push people, but encourage people to adopt kind of more robust teaching practices. And so some of the tools that we had picked, we were it was incredibly fortuitous. And so as we were transitioning learning management systems, we wanted to make sure that we had a comprehensive um, media platform system so that people could create and distribute uh, video content um, with relatively uh, little experience. And so we had integrated kind of um, a product called Studio into our learning management system. We also felt that it was incredibly important to make sure that we had a teleconferencing um, system that was available to kind of our faculty members. And so we had integrated or opted to go with Collaborate um, at that particular time because of the integration it offered with the LMS we chose. Again, simple as clicking a button, getting into a room and making sure that it was available. The other thing that was really important to us as we transitioned from kind of the learning management systems was to provide for a more equal kind of level playing ground. Um, I, I, I should have started by saying that at the beginning, um, when we started this initiative, we had just recently merged with another um, university. And so we had multiple campuses with two different LMSs that had completely different tool sets, some overlap, um, but they were unequal access. And so we had faculty teaching on both campuses and students taking courses on both campuses. And there were two different LMS systems in operation, which it, so we had created in essence kind of a have and a have not. And uh, access to those, those systems was, were limited. And so the ability to provide support even greater, right? And so going to the LMS allowed us to have kind of one um, platform where we were able to give access or provide kind of these tools to everybody on campus, regardless of which of those two campus locations that they were on. Um, and then um, some, some of the new things that we adopted or implemented as a result of the pandemic, we did bring in Zoom because faculty, some faculty had more familiarity with Zoom um, and we started to use that. They also liked it because they had a few more features than Collaborate. Um, and then uh, one of the tools that we had that I think was really significant is Visible, visible Bodies, which is kind of a, um, an online learning platform that really is focused on uh, helping faculty members with anatomy and physiology classes um, or anything having to do with the physical body. And so they can um, simply use kind of pre-made content from visible bodies or they can create their own. But again, keeping it to a limited number of tools so that it, we didn't overwhelm faculty so much. And so Judy, again, uh, one minute remaining. Okay, thank you so much. So again, these were the, the core set of online learning principles that we used. And I would have to say that uh, we weren't intending to prepare faculty for online learning, but our approach really did start to, to develop some of those key or core skills um, absolutely necessary for a readiness to teach online. And so uh, this list in front of you are those, uh, again, some key indicators of faculty-ness faculty readiness to teach online, which include elements related to course design, course communication, technical competence, and time management. Um, we definitely hit the first three, not all of those measures or markers in some of the FRTO 
guides, but we hit some essential guides. Um, time management, obviously something I need to work on and we did not introduce to faculty, but I do think that the efforts did help provide for a, a smoother transition, particularly for those faculty who we got to early on in the process um, and then continued um, to support and kind of expand the offerings as the pandemic unfolded. So thank you for being such wonderful researchers and giving us those principles. Loved it. That's great. Thanks very much, Julie. It was really interesting. Um, before we go to the, the Q&A, and if you have got any questions for Julie, please type it into the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to ask how well prepared you think your, your project um, enabled you uh, for, the, for the lockdown and the pandemic situation? Do you think staff were more prepared than they might have been? I, I do think they were more prepared than they might have been because we had been kind of introducing and talking about um, some of these key technologies beforehand. And certainly um, my team was much better prepared because we had that core curriculum in place. We had a clear goal. It was focused on kind of what's going to support teaching and learning. We had been out there talking with faculty for those eight months leading up to. And so faculty knew exactly who to come. Well, not always, but we were very clearly kind of the people to contact. And so um, that was incredibly beneficial. And you also mentioned that uh, you rolled, planned to roll out the, the new LMS on the June the 30th. Um, did that go as planned or did you have to bring that forward a little bit? We actually went as planned. Um, and, and again, we had already delayed the implementation once. At that point in time when the pandemic hit, we had, we had three different learning management systems that were operating with three different levels of technology that were available to learners. And um, just from a practical standpoint, we were like, we as the individuals responsible for two of the learning management systems said, look, we cannot continue to support this in any effective way. We need to streamline and identify one platform. And we decided to, and it was also, you know, the considerable costs involved with running those three different platforms. And so, uh, leadership made a change in consultation to move forward with that transition, um, you know, for, for that host of reasons. I have to say it was probably better uh, that we did move to one. It became much easier to provide support and education and also access to those tools that were gonna be critical in the online environment. Um, two of the learning, one of the learning management systems would not have supported an integrated um, virtual classroom. So that, that would have been a problem. <laughs> Okay, we've got a couple of questions from Stilianos um, relating to the, the support that you provided. So, uh, did your provision of self-paced development reduce the amount of demand for one-to-one -one support you had to provide? So, what we saw or what we recognized is that the type of support that people asked for really related back to their comfort level with technology. So, people who were proficient or felt very comfortable with technology, they were more likely to take advantage of the self-paced materials, whereas people who were more technologically timid, um, they tended to want very small, intimate kind of um, workshops and environments. And, and so, um, so, so the individuals who were skilled and adept went directly to the self-paced materials and, and other kinds of resources where those who needed more support or were more anxious, um, we did do a lot of consultation. So they, they kind of offset one another. And I think that ties into Stilianus's other question about was there a preference for staff that are either synchronous or asynchronous? So <laughs> did more staff come to the synchronous or, or was it a mix of both? Well, so um, initially we started out and it was all live and synchronous. And, and part of that was we had experimented with kind of doing virtual training um, the previous year and uh, didn't have a lot of uptick. Um, in uh, faculty's kind of use of those. Um, and so, but when we had to move to kind of the online environment, the asynchronous got obviously much more pro popular. Um, uh, uh, and that wasn't, that was going somewhere else. So. Um. Okay, I've uh, got a question from uh, Yui. Uh, did your implementation of Canvas emphasize the integration of third party tools or do you run the LMS alongside other tools like Zoom and Panopto? So, uh, so we do have several tools that are integrated. Panopto is integrated, um, Collaborate is integrated, Nearpod is integrated, VoiceThread is integrated. Um, and, and so again, it's a selection of tools. We also have um, at the 
uh, on request of faculty, integrated several uh, textbooks, um, Wiley, Master Paths, or, um, uh, Zybooks. So, so some of the integrations have been on request, um, but we did have a core set. Um, Zoom, we haven't integrated. We're still, uh, that is not something that my office controls and we can't get administrative access to provide the support we would like to provide. Okay, I can't see any other questions in the Q&A, so I had another question. So you talked about um, creating a sort of core set of tools uh, for, for faculty to use, but did you find some faculty chose alternative tools? Were there any particular popular ones that you might look to take on board? Uh, that's a good question. And so faculty love Nearpod, or I'm sorry, Kahoot over Nearpod. They're both audience engagement tools, but Kahoot has literally more bells and whistles and it has a gamified um, component to it that isn't um, present in, in Nearpod. And so a lot of faculty chose or opted to use Kahoot. And um, that was absolutely fine. Again, um, for faculty who choose to use additional tools, um, we provide nominal support, but it's not something that we can lead or produce resources for. Um, and so, you know, again, faculty largely rejected Collaborate and have opted for Zoom. So, you know, and, and that's kind of a trial, you know, we're learning as we go. And so uh, we're looking at some additional kinds of um, properties as well. Um, so Ian, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. We, we do a lot of coaching around kind of, um, so the question is, uh, Zoom recordings can be added to Panopto or uploaded to Panopto so that students have a little bit more control over their use. And so we had, you know, that was a lot of the resource guides that we provided, um, you know, once the pandemic started were, were explicit instructions on how to um, take recordings that might have been done in another platform and upload them to either Studio or uh, Panopto um, for easier integration in kind of the learning environment management. So we're not um, asking faculty simply to link out to recordings. We're actually coaching them to put them up on platforms that are optimized for streaming. So. Great, I think that's that's all the questions we've got. Well, thank you very much for your talk. It's thank been really you. interesting. Um, okay, we're going to hand over now to uh, Sarah Sherman and Julian Bream. They're from the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange. Uh, Sarah's director of the BLE and Julian is a digital coach. So I'll hand over you for your talk on informal approaches towards helping peers support wellbeing and development in lockdown and beyond. Thank you, Julie. That saves me doing that slide. Brilliant. Uh, so I'm going to give you a very quick overview of what we're going to cover this afternoon. We're going to introduce you to the BLE so you know who we are, what we do. Um, then we're going to put things into the COVID context, which you've probably heard a lot this conference. Um, we are still in the COVID context, but it's important you see where we're positioned. We'll tell you how we've supported our partners, the staff that, that work for the institutions we support. We're going to then do an exercise in Zoom, not a physical exercise, although you're welcome to jump up and down if it helps. And then we're going to try an experimental activity. So there's my disclaimer right there in case it doesn't work. We will always have Zoom. Anyway, you'll find out more about that in a sec. So the Bloomsbury Learning Exchange is a partnership. We work across six different universities, which are all listed at the bottom of this slide and Julian, myself and our colleague Nancy work together to support staff across the university with their acquisition and development and support of digital learning. So we bring people together, we facilitate the exchange of information, uh, we provide resources and training and anything that anyone else wants us to do. Uh, so since 2004, when I came along and the, the BLEE was set up, so it's been quite a long time, we have brought people together in groups, as you can see here, that's a bunch of librarians in the top left corner who come together with learning technologists to share practice and find out how they can collaborate on each other's projects. We have run a hands-on activity, as you can see in the bottom left corner, um, in the middle bottom, there's an, 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 a cartoon, one of our delegates is, was an artist, so he sketched um, his notes. Um, and then you can see we've done much wider conferences in the bottom right corner. We even had a go, how novel, at doing a webinar. So we, we did try out this webinar technology before we actually had to. 
In August 2019, so I'm taking you nearly two years ago into the past, we were still talking about and, and demonstrating against Brexit. It was the hottest summer on record. Um, Boris Johnson uh, suspended Parliament. He got into a bit of hot water for that. But more importantly, Julian Bream started working for the BLE, and that's because I went on maternity leave. So there was a bit of a gap there. Then a few months into Julian's tenure, this horror, we've probably seen quite a lot of these sorts of slides. I found that one of the, of the globe, but uh, the, the global pandemic hit and we were all start, told to stay at home. So that brought poor old Julian. I was long gone on maternity leave. He had come into this role to decide, you know, just to, to do some of the things that I was able to cover. Suddenly the pandemic and remote working led to him having a lot of questions and a lot of thoughts about what he was going to do. Julian. Oh, thank you. It was, you're right. It's very quickly, I, I turned up and then everyone was at home. And it was, you know, shocking and disturbing for a lot of people. And I come from a sort of coaching background and very quickly it became clear that what staff responded to was um, acknowledging what happened. And over all the different kind of events we had, um, it became really clear that there were two, two things that you've heard a lot about already. You know, for want of a better word, Zoom fatigue, how it affects people physically, socially, cognitively, emotionally. We heard powerfully about that this morning from, uh, from Neil and Eileen. And also that experience of Zoom fatigue, like in the small frame, is within that bigger frame of people being in unfamiliar places, like at home the whole time, or surrounded by their family or other people. Um, that idea of emotional labour came up a lot, and just the stress of everything people have to deal with. And then they're trying to do, a, do their work together, teaching professional services in this narrow frame. Uh, next, please. So very quickly, we reorganized the kind of support we gave to people, but just by making it informal as possible. Sort of drop in using like WhatsApp, because you know we're all at home. Uh, webinars without agendas, we're sort of rather than saying, this is what it's gonna be about. It's more like, what do you need to talk about? Uh, some lessons from coaching it was the thing about establishing a safe, comfortable online space. So if you make people feel safe, if you can, if everyone involved is uh, using their humanity and really just saying what's going on for them, whatever the business of the online session is, seem to get done a lot more, you know, a lot more effectively. If you say like, hey, I'm sitting here, but the door's going to go any minute or my dog's about to bark. Is that OK? That makes such a difference. Um, we tried some different platforms as well as Zoom and Teams and Blackboard, Skype, WhatsApp. These other ones, Wonder, Gather Town, so on. These, these are these are ones. They're not official, but ones where you can move around. Um, they're not well established, and so that's why you might not have heard of them in the university context. Uh, next, please. So returning to the idea of acknowledging the fatigue people have, exhaustion, emotional labour. Um, and within any meeting, particularly attending to the beginning, making space for relationship, connecting people to each other where possible, you know, introducing people to what's going on, trying to say hello to everyone, checking in, how are you doing? What's going on for you right now? So people can say, yes, I've been sitting here for the last six hours. And then everyone knows. And then that makes life a lot, a lot easier for people to get these things off their chest and also know and understand where people are coming from and make agreements around what we're going to do next. How the session will work. When it'll end, can we end it sooner? That's always popular. And speaking of agreements, that's enough of us talking. This is an opportunity to turn your attention onto yourselves. Think about 
your experience in this frame of the Zoom webinar. And I say Zoom webinar, I've been chosen for very good reasons to facilitate this conference. But think about your needs right now within it. And also within your wider context of wherever you are, in a workplace or at home or somewhere else, and who's around. And what are you noticing? I think what would help them engage more right now? Oh, well, we can find out. Next slide is we could, because uh, this way we could do a bit of an, ex an exercise. Is this is an invitation for you to share. You at home, there are 55 people here. Something you might not have appreciated, but yeah, you're here with 55 other people. And if you start using the chat box, you start sharing with them. And I know this isn't you know, devastating pedagogy, but at the same time, it's a chance just to reflect and be self-conscious of all the powerful messages that have come across about equality of access and experience in this conference. So in the chat box, take a moment to reflect on your experience of being at RIDE 2021. Think of a takeaway, something you've learned or something that's made an impact on you. And please write it in the chat box. To all attendees, by the way, it says to panelists. Another one is to all attendees. So take a moment and then write something. This is your chance to change the energy. I've been sitting here listening, just going to mix it up. And if you write right now, if you see something you like pop up, comment on that. Because you have absolute permission in this next session. Well, the remainder of this session, we've got 20 minutes to do this, to share, to find out about what's going on, find out what you've learned. Or you could say something about your home context, your experience of being online. Now then, whilst that's happening, we've got something that this is for some of you to do. OK, this is an exercise. So I want you to keep doing that. For some of you, if you are on a desktop or a laptop only. So apologies, this isn't for people on a phone or a mobile, tablet, iPad. And also within that, if you have a desktop and laptop, if you've got Chrome browser or Edge, Microsoft Edge browser, so that's not Apple Safari or Firefox. Again, you might be saying, hey, this is, you know, this is an unequal experience. And in a way it is. It's kind of helping us really experience and take away the idea that, yeah, this isn't equal. People's access is not equal. And this, it, this exercise now isn't, and it's because of the limitations of the technology. We're, and we're not recommending the technology because it's not accessible to everyone. So I'll make that quite clear. However, if you are up for just trying something different, I'm gonna put a link here in a minute and it's like Zoom again, but you kind of move around. And again, we you just go to this place, you'll see other people, start talking. Um, next slide, please. This is just going to show you very quickly what it looks like. So again, if you're on a desktop or a laptop and you've got Chrome or Edge, you can come here. I'll tell you where it is in a minute. Next slide. That's it empty. That's it when there's people in it. Next slide. The task is to talk in groups of three. And move around because in this one you can. It's not breakout rooms, you're not restricted. Move around. Next slide, please. And someone joins your group, you move to another one. Next slide, please. So no, this is the this is the uh, the link there. It's that bitly. Bitly, and it's ride, it's this conference and today's date in UK format, 1806, 2021. Bitly ride, 1806, 2021. If you go, you can go there right now. Importantly, switch off this Zoom because it can't do both at once because this other one wants to use your camera and audio. 
agree to that and you're on. I'll pop over there in a minute and we'll see, see if you get there. Everyone else who doesn't get there or if it doesn't work, come back here and keep going through the chat. And I will still be here and so will Julie, I think. So I'm going to jump off now and go to the other, the other place and start saying hello to whoever makes it across. If it doesn't work, there's no, no shame because it's this technology never works for everybody because it's okay so i'm going to jump off now so guys that's why we're calling it an experimental activity so julian has now left the room we're not going to start talking about him or anything like that we're professionals but the link is now in the chat so hopefully you can all see that and i'll keep putting it in so you need to close down the zoom and go down go into this new uh space that we've created um, and if you get stuck or you get lost or you aren't comfortable leaving uh, the sanctuary safety of Zoom, then just stay here because we will also continue to, to work together and do some activities. So um, I can see I've got a separate computer running. Hopefully my Wi-Fi is not going to crash on me and I can see a few people already joining the, the Wonder link. Um, but um, I will keep putting the link in. So just give it a go. Uh, feel safe to leave Zoom. And as I said, you can always come back here if it hasn't worked. I'll start keeping an, an eye on the chat soon just to see um, if anyone's having any difficulties. And then once I think everyone has gone, uh, we can have a go at, at an activity here for those that are left in the room. I see that there are still 40 people in here. Some have made the great escape and have closed down Zoom, which we all still feel very welded to, I think, at the moment in, in these times. Um, but the, the link is there. And if, you've, if you haven't grabbed the link from the chat, so I would say grab it, cut, cut and paste it, copy and paste it and put it into a notepad or a Word document or something, just so you've got it so that when you leave Zoom, you've still got the link. Of course, you can um, copy it as well into your own clipboard on your computer. Um, so yeah, I can see lots more people are roaming around, which is great. Um, at some point I'll, I can show you my screen on my other computer so you can get a feel for what it actually looks like in there. How are we getting on in here? 34 of you left, 33 of you. It's like a, a, the opposite of what you usually expect when you're doing an online meeting, when you start to see people coming into the room. Now, now I'm counting down as people are exiting. Um, so this is good, but do come back if you feel lost or alone or stuck and it hasn't worked for you. Um, the people who are in the space at the moment are finding each other and moving into you literally you click on your little avatar and you drag it through uh, to meet people. If you're not able to, to try out Wonder today, you can go to it at any other time. Um, I can make sure that you've got the link. So um, you can try it at your uh, pleasure. It's free to use. Um, I think if you want to use it institutionally, I think now you can probably create a few space, three up to three spaces for free, which is nice. Still 30 of you in the room, which is fine. Um, if you want to put in the chat, if you're struggling or you're not quite sure what to do, feel free to now put in into the, the, the usual chats. The main chat doesn't have to be the Q&A one. Um, if you're having any problems or you're just not comfortable leaving Zoom, that's also all right. So for those of you who are still, oops, so for those of you who are still in the space, um, do you want to just put in the chat why, why, how you're doing, what's going on? Are you finding it disconcerting to leave Zoom where, where you've been for the last three and a half days? Ah, okay. So Nancy is on a tablet, which is fine. So you stay where you are, Nancy, and we will we will do some um, alternative activities together. Um, if anyone else wants to share where they are, what they're up to, what they want to to try out. You're welcome. I'm going to move the slide on now, but I'll ever so often I'll put the link back in. So if now we've got 28 people who are staying in Zoom, um, let's go back to the exercise that we started earlier with Julian, which is 
have a think about what you've experienced at Ride so far. Today might be your the first and only time that you you were able to join the conference, but but post in in the chat something that you uh, are going to take away with you, something that you've learned. It might not even be about any of the practice you've heard, but it might be an experience that you've had being an, an online delegate, something that um, you wouldn't have occurred to you had you not have been participating in Ride. If you pop that into the chat. Um, then we can we can start to explore and, and have a look at what each other is doing. Um, so Mary Irene has already said that she uses Wonder quite a lot, really likes it, and it's not just you're just not in a position to be able to to, to join that. Absolutely fine. So it's great actually. I've got a, a, a fellow Wonder user, in, but we're staying we can stay on in Zoom. But it's something that. Um, as Julian says, it's sort of it feels much more of a, an informal, flexible space that once people have made that leap and, and tried it out, um, we can sort of see how how easy it is to, to navigate. It's fairly simple and straightforward. Obviously, there are some uh, technical requirements. You need to have a Chrome browser or Edge, which I don't have. I don't think I've ever used Edge. I don't think I'll ever want to. Um, I'm much more of a Chrome fan myself. But there there are limits also with the lack of tablet and the lack of um, mobile. But there are other platforms out there. We're just we're not exploring the technology. We're using the kind of alternative space that it provides so a bit less formal less structured than than zoom and teams as, as most of us have been used to uh, so just having a look up now there's there's still there's 29 people so i think somebody might have come back which is fine but you have been using um, the conference platform has been zoom it's uh, very different the last ride i went to was in 2019 very much in the present at senate house in the the um, beautiful Macmillan Hall. Uh, so this is quite a different thing. Um, how is it for you being an online delegate, not being able to physically interact and, and enjoy lunch and, and consuming beverages together with colleagues or people you haven't seen for a long time? Um, yes, absolutely, Linda. There is the link. I'll just put it in the chat again. So anyone who's just joined late can wander off into the wonder link the alternative room but for those of us still here how have you found it what has been your uh experience of the ride conference um i've got the mic i'll keep talking as anyone left in the room who knows me knows i'm quite capable of just talking uh randomly uh forever um i I'm actually a terrible online delegate at conferences. I find it really hard to be disciplined and pay attention and commit to sitting um, at my desk in my spare rooms. You can see that I'm in um, to a conference. I find the distraction of email or even knowing that I've got emails coming in sometimes hard to fight. Also, I think because I'm... Um, um, part time, I only work three and a half days a week. My stress and worry is that I'm taking time when other things are happening. And so then I end up doing both at the same time. So I think I just ha I really lack this the discipline and being an online delegate. How I don't know how you've all um, found it. I'm now going to try and read and speak at the same time, which is all is quite difficult. Um, so that is, Julie's come back. Um, you weren't sure people could hear you and wonder, but you stayed in the Zoom session in case that's, ah, okay, yes, you have to leave, Julie, you have to leave Zoom, it's a scary thing to do, um, but I'm staying here so you can come back, um, um, that is probably because it, the uh, microphone and camera is only using one or the other platform, that's why you can't use both, I thought you were being clever in using two computers. Um, Simon is is missing the informal networking and there's I've been going to ride conferences for about I don't know 15 years and it's it's sometimes it's a place you go um, just to catch up with people that you haven't seen in a year um, I've had some very deep and meaningful conversations at, at CD ride conferences where um, nothing even to do with the topics um, but, but have happened in that space um, Simon's also saying you put on out of office messages. Absolutely, you can turn off Teams, put on your either do not disturb or just that you're out. I'm just, yeah, I still find I'm distracted too easily. Um, but yeah, I ought to. I think also because I returned back from maternity leave in November and you guys had been remote working for a good six or nine months prior to that. So um, 
I still feel, even though it's I'm now six months back to work, I still feel that I'm kind of new at this online remote working, and um, this is the first conference that has that I've attended, um, um, you know, or attempted to attend attend since that time. So hopefully, you're you're uh, maybe share some of your coping strategies. Simon obviously is is turning things off and uh, putting out out of office announcements, but. Um, yeah, how, how else have you been managing in, in remote working and, and being at conferences? Again, drawing upon your experiences at this time round would, would be really good. Um, I'm having a look at some of the other notes there. Um, scrolling up the chat. I think also being a delegate in a Zoom webinar is, I've never done it before. So this is the first time using, is it Zoom webinar? I think is the, it's a slightly different tool version of the zoom that we usually use and um, I know as a delegate that you don't know how many other people are in the session it could just be me and Andrew who's facilitating and Julie who's our chair and there could be no one else here at all but I can see that there are 27 participants including the three of us in this call um, but I think as a delegate not even knowing who else you're in the room with is a bit weird but, but maybe that's just me um, that also is a bit difficult. I can't see everybody. Ah, maybe I can make this a bit bigger. Ah, I can make my window bigger, and I can see that Famia has said it's interesting to listen to various ideas presented by the panelists at Ride, and it's been reassuring to know we're all dealing with similar situations and issues at the moment. I, I, that's totally true, and and we're so far apart from each other, sort of geographically, and yet the the experiences have been very similar. Um, uh, for me, it also said it's been helpful thinking about how to move forward and integrate synchronous and asynchronous learning. Um, which is true. I'm going to whiz down just to check that nothing else has come in. Nope. So help me out, guys, if there are still 20 something of you in here. Any any takeaways? It could be as, as simple as that you need to get a new office chair because you realise sitting um, for two and a half hours without a, a rest or anything or out of a, a break um, is damaging to your glutes. Anything that you've realised from your own practice that you need to improve. It, it worked for me, I think, having um, uh, conference time without my daughter being here and having a childcare day, because sometimes she's downstairs being looked after by a grandparent, and that can be distracting not only for me, but for people who can hear her. Uh, Karen has just got a new office chair and it's changed her life this week. Fantastic news. I'm in a very damaged and, and battered old chair that I've had for donkey's years. Um, I'm also about to lose my monitor. I've got a lovely, great big monitor, but my husband needs to reclaim that. So um, I was hoping that I could sneak into college because I, I live very close to one of the universities, but you have to do go through the right channels and purchase one. Um, so Ron got very lost in the transfer to Wonder. Um, so okay, so maybe a reflection on, on the real your real life experiences as well. But that's kind of I would say that's also part of this exercise. So how is it as a delegate to experience leaving something which although we don't always like Zoom, but we're comfortable and familiar with it, and to take that leap and go somewhere else almost like a, a technological leap um i'm going to ah uh, i think because i haven't uh, interacted with the space for a while it has decided to throw me out let's have a look see if i can get back in um okay so i can see on the other screen maybe i can show it to you let's take my camera off so i don't know how can uh, that's not going to come up to neat is it that is the wonder me space yeah it's too blurred i tried but um i know julian is extremely good at um in fact i think he's just done one he's taken a screenshot of the screen and he can share that with um the people who weren't able to make it today so anybody else has anyone come back from wonder me like ron did anyone back from the from the dystopia feeling of leaving the safety zoom come back um and julie's also put in another prompt as, as a question which is also very related to the online experiences usually ride is, is a is a full day it starts usually around well we give a bit of travel time but usually around 10 ish i guess um and goes all the way through to about 3 in the afternoon a whole day this time round, obviously 
things are different, life is different. We've done three half day sessions, two mornings and an afternoon. I'm wondering how um, people felt about that, if that worked for you. Um, if you prefer the flexibility of being able to dip in and out, as Simon said, or um, if you actually think it's a better use of time to, to consolidate one whole day for conference. Um, but then, yeah, an online conference all day, sat in this, and we're not, we haven't, we're not all Karen, we don't all have brand new chairs to, to enjoy and be comfortable in. Um, how's that been? How's it all been for you? I'm gonna click on, um, Julie has shared on the, um, actually you should be able to see that as well. That's what it looks like at the moment. Can you all still see my screen? I think you can. Uh, there's a tweet that Julie's just sent with all of these little threesomes or foursomes or twosomes, but we're getting there, having their conversations. Let's go back to this, um, the slides. So I don't have the ability to turn on microphones, which is why I'm so sorry you've hear, heard my droning to tones for the last um, 20 something minutes. We've got four minutes left of the session. Um, if you haven't contributed anything yet into the chat, um, we've not used the, the Q&A, we haven't had a, a need to, but if you want to put anything else into the chat about what how you feel about today, um, Julie's wondering if people maybe have lost focus um, and have been maybe going back to, to and from the day job um, rather than allowing yourselves to be immersed into the single um, session, single event. Um, so Karen, thank you for providing some feedback. In terms of the half days, you, th you thought it would be good initially, but in the end, you would have preferred a whole day so you could ded dedicate yourself to it. Uh, where you've, you've got drawn into work stuff. And I think you're right. I think even though it was half days, was it like two and a half hours each day? That's still quite a big chunk. I mean, I know when I do an online meeting these days, I don't make any meetings longer than 90 minutes max if I can help it. So there's a lot of time um, uh, there that people may be worrying about. Um, so Ian, does that mean you were there and you've come back and that it was a surreal experience being in wonder? Or is it just general going back into the real world and going to an office? Julie, but you said that we can hear Julie and I can't, but maybe you're hearing it through Wonder. Not sure. Uh, so Ian's saying having me us on Zoom and Wonder at the same time. Yeah, I, I don't think you can. I think it, it's, um, I think the computer mic and ca webcam will only, and, and speakers will only use one platform. So um, that's why you want people to, to feel comfortable enough to leave Zoom, but, but knowing that we're all here and, and ready to go. Um, thank you, Sylvester. Um, that, that's kind of you to say. Um, yeah. So for me, you would have preferred a whole day as well. Uh, because easier to focus on the conference then than having two set three sessions or three half days that is true I guess the flip side of that is the flexibility so people could have a good look at the program and really decide I definitely want to go to that session I can't go to this session I've got a meeting um, but knowing that they've got the flexibility of, of dipping in and out which you couldn't you couldn't do in the real, real world. You could try, but um, it's usually frowned upon in conferences if you pop into someone's uh, in a session and then you leave before the next speaker starts. Um, Ian's lunch is ready and waiting, so that's good. That's one uh, benefit, I guess, having a home-cooked lunch. Although catering at Senate House is usually pretty top-notch, so really fingers and toes crossed that we're all back together in some way next year. I highly recommend getting there in person because the, as I said, Senate House catering is pretty awesome. The first time I had bowl food was at a Senate House gig. Um, so Mary Irene is going to go over some of the recordings from the session and maybe that wouldn't have been available face to face. I think actually that's a very good point. We have struggled in the past sometimes with, with AV, but now it's sort of, it has to be done in this way. There'll be much more options to go back. And um, yeah, that's a really, really good point. So Barbara had a go, had a go, has tried out Wanda and hadn't heard of it before. But thank you, Barbara, for coming back into the Zoom to let us know that. That's really great. Um, we didn't think we would have time to do that. I can see it's one o'clock now, Julie. Do you want to um, say any last words? 
Yes, just uh, thank you to Sarah and Julian for an interesting experience over in Wanda.me. I don't think anyone could hear my microphone, but as we said, that's because I stayed in the Zoom. Uh, and thank you to, to Julie for her presentation as well. So it's been a really interesting session. I think that that's it for RIDE. Um, there is a feedback form, as you'd expect. So please do provide us your feedback uh, and reflect on some of the things that you've shared today as well. That would be great. So thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon or rest of the day, depending on where you are in the world. And, and hopefully we'll see you at the next RIDE. Uh, there will be an event in the October. We normally run a supporting students success event. So do keep an eye out on Twitter and on the mailing list for, for that as well.